organic matter on Mars and uh, what we've learned with the Curiosity rover that is pictured uh, here on the left and what we will learn with the ExoMars rover that is pictured here on the right. Okay, so first a little bit of background on why organic compounds are so, um, so important and why it matters so much for us. There, is, there are different steps to answer the uh, long-standing question of did ever life uh, appeared uh, on Mars? And is there, is there life on Mars? There are different steps that we need to follow one by one. You cannot jump the, the, the steps and look directly for life when you look for life on Mars or any other planets. First, you need to investigate the general context of the location. So is the geology consistent with a long-term preservation of like remnants? It means that when you look for life on Mars, you look for past life on Mars, not present. Past meaning uh, 4 billion years old. And uh, if the context, the geological context is not um, uh, consistent with the, the 4 billion er years old preservation of the matter, life or no life, you would not detect it today. So first, it has to be the right context at the, um, at the global and local um, scale where you're looking for, for life. Second, when if the, context is, if the context is right, you need to look for habitability. Where the condition gathered at the same place and at the same time for life to emerge. The habitability criteria are first a long standing water, a source of energy, mild conditions of temperature, pH, pressure, salinity, etc., and the presence of organic matter, simple organic matter as food for life, not as remnants of life, but as food for life. The life needs to, uh, to build up on chemistry and on molecules. And all of that has to be stable enough in the environment for um, uh, tens or hundreds of, uh, of years, of uh, thousands of years, or even millions of years. It cannot be a few years of this environment for life to emerge, even if all the criteria are gathered together. And then when you know that the context is right and the habitability is right, you can look for direct traces of life or biosignature. So can we directly look for biosignature at, um, uh, at, at Mars? And why are organic matter uh, or grail? It's because it answers two of these criteria. As I discussed the, ha the habitability criteria with simple organic matter as building blocks of life, but also when you look at direct traces of life or biosignatures, the biosignatures are um, uh, usually a uh, chemical uh, matter. So organic matter, complex organic matter. So organic matter, it's our grade because it has two of uh, this uh, response possible for looking for habitability and looking for life. So all the missions in, uh, in the Martian landscape, uh, landscape helped in uh, answering one or many of, uh, of those three criteria, the context, the habitability, and the, the signs of life. So those are the current uh, uh, missions, even if opportunity is still, uh, is still <laughs> on, this, uh, on this graph, but it's not current anymore, unfortunately. And what I will focus on is first the Curiosity rover, because Curiosity was the first in the Martian program to look for habitability on Mars. And the ExoMars rover, because it will be the, uh, so it's uh, now uh, planned to be sent in 2022. It was initially planned for 2020, so that's why it's still in the 2020 window, but it will be sent in 2022. And it's the first in the new era to look for signs of life. And when I say in the new era, it's because in 1976, we had one mission, uh, the Viking landers, that were already looking for signs of life on Mars, but unfortunately did not follow the right steps of context, habitability, and life. It jumped the steps directly looking for life. And not knowing the context, the um, experiments that were on board were not uh, relevant. And it led to positive results because of the context of the Martian soil. Well, that's why uh, it's a new era of looking uh, signs of, of life.
Um, I'm not talking about the Mars 2020 rover because uh, the uh, astrobiology part of this mission is when we return the sample back on Earth in the early 2030s. But the rover itself do not have instruments to look for signs of life. So it's a, it's a, it's a, a different long-term program for Mars, Mars sample return. So uh, speaking of context, if you, if you superimpose the time scale of the terrestrial uh, time scale at the bottom and the Martian time scale at the top, what's interesting here is that the emergence of life on the Earth, it's about 4 billion years old on the Earth, and it corresponds uh, on a, a geological time scale to the age of the Gale crater, which is a crater in which Curiosity rover landed in 2012. Uh, the Gale crater was dated to 3.6 to 3.8 billion years old, which is about the time where life emerged uh, on the Earth. So we can imagine that if the habitability and the context was good for life to emerge, uh, uh, the probability of life to actually emerge why pretty high because it's when it did on the Earth. So Curiosity, um, uh, it's a rover that landed in 2012 in the Gale Crater close to the equator. And it's a three meter long uh, rover, 900 kilogram composed of 10 instruments. And out of the 900 kilogram of the rover, only eight 80 kilograms or uh, so less than 10 percent are the scientific payload. It landed in Gale Crater because it was chosen from orbit. It has um, a superimposition of different layers that has a high interest in the habitability. Uh, it has the a, a clay layer and we know that clays are good for preservation of organic molecules and it has a sulfate unit topping the clay unit. And there is also a hemat hematite ridge that was observed from orbit and other type of, um, of uh, layers and mineralogy. So that's why it was chosen. And also it was found to be um, an ancient lake and it has all the potential for uh, preserving organics and preserving uh, the, the uh, traces of habitability. So the main objective of this rover, uh, as I already stated, was not to look for life, but to look for past and present habitability at Gale Crater. So one of the uh, one of the ten instruments of Curiosity is the SAM instrument, the Sample Analysis at Mars. It's only one out of 10 instruments, but it's half of the scientific payload. It's the most complex instrument that has been sent uh, to Mars. And it's a suite of different subunits. There are three subunits in the SAM instrument. The size of SAM is about um, a microwave, a big microwave size, and it's 40 kilogram. It's situated in the belly of the rover and it can receive the sample, the solid sample that are drilled or scooped from the soil and rocks on Mars uh, into the funnels that are at the top. And the three subunits can be used either separately or together, coupled together. The three subunits are a gas chromatograph or GC composed of six different columns to separate individual compounds from a mixture of different uh, molecules. There is, um, oops, sorry, need to do that. A mass spectrometer uh, or MS that will identify the molecules from their mass. It can be used either uh, on its own or coupled to the GC. And there is also the TLS, the tunable, tunable laser spectrometer that can look for isotopes of molecules and particularly uh, methane. So the the two modes that I'm going to talk more about is the direct MS uh, analysis, uh, what we call EGA for evolved gas analysis. There is a diagram in the next slides to explain how it works. And also the coupling between the GC and the MS, which is a GC-MS analysis for uh, separating uh, the compounds and identifying 
them by uh, by the MS. But first, just a little bit with the, just one slide with the TLS because the TLS, as I said, was also specified to uh, to look at the atmosphere and the methane. And methane, uh, composed of uh, one carbon and four hydrogen, is a simple organic molecule. Organic molecules are molecules composed of carbon and hydrogen. So methane is the simplest of all. It's considered by some uh, chemists not to be an organic molecule because it's so simple, but uh, uh, literally speaking, it is. So a little slide about, uh, about the, the methane uh, diary that, <laughs> that uh, uh, we, we have with the TLS instrument. There are two interesting um, uh, findings that were done with the, with the methane. Uh, the first one is that there is a background of methane at about 0.7 ppb parts per billion in volume uh, on Mars. And at some locations, and particularly uh, about midway through our route, so in yellow, it's the route that we have followed, about midway uh, through our, our route uh, here, we, we observed a spike of methane up to seven ppb. So 10 times the, the background. And it's totally unexplained. We've, uh, we've looked for, for many uh, uh, potential correlation with the rover location, the season, the dust opacity, uh, the pressure, the direction of the wind, or to, to try to understand why uh, there is a spike and none of this correlation could be done. So the spike is totally unexplained, and, but there is a spike of, of methane. So this was presented in a paper by Chris Webster in 2015. And three, three years later, in 2018, uh, Chris uh, uh, reported in, uh, in another paper a background, um, um, uh, uh, yes, a background of methane that that is uh, uh, um, varying with seasons. So there is this uh, wavy pattern, and uh, again, it's unexplained. And that's the two um, uh, the, the two methane um, uh, findings that that were done by Curiosity: the spike and the seasonal background of um, uh, seasonal variation of the of the methane. The methane is very interesting because on the Earth it's mostly um, made by life, but on Mars, uh, obviously, it's not the uh, the priority uh, uh, hypothesis, and the origin of the methane is more likely to to be um, uh, from uh, from mineralogical uh, processes. So back to our uh, GC and uh, MS uh, and direct MS analysis. So how does SAM work? We have cups in which we can fill uh, one to three portions of sample. One portion is 50 milligrams. So we can load either 50 to 150 milligram of sample in an oven. And this oven is heated from ambient to about 900 degrees uh, with the rate of 35 degrees per minute. While we are heating the sample, uh, helium goes through and is pushing um, what the molecules that are evolving from the sample directly to the MS. So that's a direct uh, EGA mode or evolved gas analysis, which is more a mode to analyze the mineralogical uh, context of, uh, of the sample, which means that uh, we analyze in MS the masses that are evolved uh, along the heating rate of, um, of the sample. So if you have um, uh, sulfate, you know that sulfate decomposed around 600 degrees into SO2, and around six degrees, you will observe an um, uh, SO2 peak in the QMS at mass uh, 64. So that's more mineralogical. And the second mode that is, uh, that is complementary is the GCMS mode. And the GC, the, no, sorry, I was using my mouse on the wrong window. And um, the, the GCMS mode is, uh, so it's, you're using, you're heating the sample up to 900 degrees, but this time uh, the sample, uh, the evolved gas are diverted into the hydrocarbon trap. And this trap will be held at five degrees C to concentrate all the evolved gas and uh, when the heating of the sample is over, 
we hit the hydrocarbon trap to perform a flash injection, a punctual injection into the GCMS, because the GC needs to receive all the molecules at once. It cannot receive the molecules along the 25 minutes um, uh, during the heating of the sample. It has to be a flash injection so that the molecules are separated along the way and then they are released one by one at the end of the gas chromatograph to be analyzed and identified in the QMS, in the mass spectrometer. And this was a simplified uh, gas diagram, but this is the actual gas diagram. And it's not only to show that it's very complex, but it's to show here that we have a high versatility with some, with some instruments. And this is very precious when you, do not know what you're going to find. And with thanks to the high versatility of some, we were able to adapt from run to run our experiments and to, to, uh, to make discoveries that we were, would not be able to do if we had a very fixed instrument with one type of experiment only. So here we analyze and we are creating new experiments uh, with the, with the, after eight, eight years on Mars, we, we make experiments that were absolutely not, um, uh, uh, that some was not made for that. And we are able to, to, uh, to crank, crank up the temperatures, to invert some pass flow, uh, to preheat a sample. And we, the high versatility allows us to really play with the same instrument. And it's very key in, um, in, uh, in the uh, in, uh, ex exploration of, um, of Mars. I have just a short video, it's uh, less, th less than a minute to, ex to show what, uh, uh, with better images, what I just showed. Uh, let me know if it goes well. It's less than a minute, anyway. It's to show the SAM instrument and how it works. So SAM is situated in the belly of the rover and you can see the six columns of the GC. And the sample is dropped into some instruments in the oven and it's heated to 900 degrees. While it's heated, you release the um, molecules from the sample. It's flushed away by helium in an injection trap. So everything is trapped during the heating and then it's um, uh, injected into uh, one or multiple of the GC columns. And then they are separated by size and by mass. And what's uh, uh, the results of this GCMS experiment is what you see on the, uh, on, on the top. It's, a, it's called the chromatogram. And the chromatogram in X axis is the retention time of the molecule, which means the time the molecule spent into the GC column before being eluted from it. The GC column, I did not specify, but it's 30 meters long. So it's a very long column where the molecules are interacted with a chemical phase that is inside the column. And depending on the chemical and physical properties of the molecule, it will interact more or less and spend more or less time into the columns. So a molecule that do not interact with uh, the internal phase of the GC column will go straight through the 30 meters of the column and can elute in like one minute. And a molecule which will interact much more can take uh, 30 or 40 minutes to elute from the column. And the chromatogram shows the retention time of uh, the molecule, which is one very important parameter. And uh, in Y axis, it's the intensity of, of the molecule. The more of the molecules are present, the, the highest intensity is. And then the second, um, uh, the second dimension of this analysis is that for each peak, for each molecule, uh, you can have the mass of this molecule thanks to the um, uh, analysis in the mass spectrometer. And the combination between the retention time and the mass spectrum um, identify definitely one molecule. So that's how we identify the molecules with uh, the complex molecules with them. And that's the theory of, uh, of the chromatogram. You have one peak, one molecule. But this is the uh, actual data that we receive from SAM. So for each mass, you have very complex uh, set of data, which uh, shows here that 
it's a very, very lengthy and complex process for analysis. It's not lab data, it's Mars data. And, uh, and uh, we, it, it takes a long time to deconvolute. And also it takes a lot of laboratory runs to understand the data. It's a very much iterative process between laboratory and between Mars data. And from the data, we think we find something, we will confirm it in the lab, but also in the lab, we will use the data we have from Mars to predict what can be found on Mars. And we will perform a directed search. And that's what we prefer to search specifically for something instead of just looking and trying to find something in, uh, in this uh, really messy data. So that two, two different approaches that we have in parallel and um, and you, you can understand from the, the messy data why we, we really uh, prefer the directed search for, uh, for organics. Since uh, the landing in 2012, uh, Curiosity has uh, worked over 3,100 uh, souls. The soul is a Martian day. Uh, we have driven 25 kilometers that you can see the pass of the 25 kilometer uh, here. And uh, we have drilled 30 samples and the scooped three of them, um, or three of other samples. And amongst those the samples drilled and scooped, Sam has analyzed 26 out of 30 drilled samples and has analyzed uh, the three scooped location. The, the drill is, uh, you can see that all the different drills that were done along our 25 kilometers and they are reported as red dots on the, on the traverse and in orange, there are the scooped samples. And uh, what's interesting here is to observe the different colors of the drills that uh, has been done, uh, which show different state uh, of oxidation of the sample and different mineralogy. And I will focus principally on the Cumberland sample, which is the second drill sample and the most interesting one in terms of organics that we have found on Mars. And also a little bit on the Mojave sample that also had uh, some, some interesting patterns in organic molecules. The drill is uh, for the scale, it's 1.6 centimeter in diameter and it's a maximum of seven centimeters deep. And the last ones, they are even shallower because we had an issue with the drill bit and it was fixed, but we could not use the drill as we did in the beginning. And it led to a, a shallower um, drill holes in when the sample is, um, is to, uh, uh, is, um, is not, not smooth enough. This is a Cumberland uh, photo of uh, at the Yellowknife Bay. The Yellowknife Bay is uh, the uh, the Gale Crater floor sediment, and it was the first drill site analyzed by Sam. Uh, we drilled two samples separated by two point five meters. The first one was the John Klein, and the second one was the Cumberland, uh, right here. And uh, it was at the, the it was a lake deposit uh, at the the at at, uh, at this place of the of the crater. Uh, on the Cumberland drill hole, uh, zoomed out, zoomed in, on the at the bottom shows that there is a drill hole of Cumberland, and there is on the right what we call the mini drill which was used initially by Curiosity to test um, the, the, the rock and uh, how hard was the rock to then adapt the drill um, uh, perforation to the right depth. And that's uh, that the, the first results on the organic molecules. And uh, oops. so, on, on this slide, there are so, so many things to say. So first, first detection of organic molecules on Mars, uh, the chlorobenzene was detected at Cumberland up to 300 parts uh, per billion, so PPB in the weight. And the top chromatogram is a sample. The bottom chromatogram is the blank where we did the exact same experiment with no sample. 
uh, to show that uh, that's uh, that's not a contamination uh, that we had uh, from uh, from uh, from the instrument. But then it's not only that. Um, the the chlorohydrocarbons that were detected at Cumberland they're composed uh, of chlorine in green and carbon in gray, but they are likely not present as Dutch in the sample. They are likely made out from oxychlorine present in the sample, and that is widespread on Mars and a precursor of um, uh, carbon containing molecules. And the combination of chlorine and carbon, both Martian make those chlorohydrocarbons uh, on, on SAM. So we, we were asking what are the potential precursors, the carbon containing precursor that were not chlorinated and that in presence of prochlorate would make chlorobenzene. There were some lab experiments that were done with benzene, toluene, and uh, phthalic acid, benzoic acid, and malytic acid mixed all together um, independently with, uh, with, uh, with perchlorates. And the result is that you need a functionalized um, uh, aromatic uh, to make some chlorobenzene. So benzene and toluene in presence of perchlorate in some condition would not make chlorobenzene, but phthalic acid or benzoic acid or phenol will make chlorobenzene. But actually it would make chlorobenzene. And when we presented that initially saying that we expect a phthalic acid or benzoic acid to be the precursor of the chlorobenzene we observed on SAM, uh, uh, people ask, okay, but when you perform that in the lab, you see chlorobenzene, but you also see dichlorobenzene. Why don't you see dichlorobenzene on SAM? And that was a very good question. And uh, we looked specifically for dichlorobenzene because we like the directed search. So we performed lab uh, experiments in the lab to understand where were the, what was the retention time of dichlorobenzene. And we looked specifically for at this retention time or on our SAM data. And before showing that we did actually uh, find dichlorobenzene, let me talk to you about the timeline. The uh, Cumberland drill was uh, in May 2013, and the publication uh, of this dichlor uh, chlorobenzene and, dichlor and chlorohydrocarbons uh, was published in uh, uh, February 2015. It took two years not to identify the chlorobenzene, but to prove that uh, and to bring evidence that the carbon from uh, this molecule was not from our internal background. It was um, um, really a pain to show that the carbon was not uh, coming from our internal background because we do have um, a leak of a solvent that we brought with us for performing wet chemistry that contain carbon. And, uh, and so we wanted to make sure that this carbon from the wet chemistry solvent was not the origin of the chlorobenzene and other chlorohydrocarbon that we detected on Mars. So back to our dichlorobenzene, we looked specifically for it and yeah, we found it. And it's an image on the, on the right. And we found dichlorobenzene at the right retention time, but we also found two isomers of the dichlorobenzene. And this was published in 2020. So you remember that Camoland uh, was drilled in 2013. So seven years after the drill, we were able to identify the dichlorobenzene. And this time it was the identification which took time, not the, uh, the, the, um, the disproof of uh, internal contamination. And uh, at the bottom here on the chromatogram, you see a lab chromatogram. Uh, and to, to, to find out the retention time of the chlorobenzene and dichlorobenzene, because to look for something very, very tiny, you need to know exactly where to look in your data. There is a, a slight difference in the retention time of uh, SAM and laboratory because it's hard to get the same um, inlet pressure. And we know that there is this difference in retention time. Okay, a little parenthesis now, because uh, you remember that I said in 1976, uh, Viking landers were sent to, uh, to Mars to look for, for life, and there were organic molecules analysis. 
uh, two molecules were analyzed, uh, uh, were found uh, uh, at this time. It was chloromethane and dichloromethane, but unfortunately, the Viking lander was cleaned with dichloromethane. So it was uh, assumed that the chloromethane and dichloromethane found on Viking um, uh, GCMS was due to the cleaning solvent that was used on the lander. But what we did here, uh, talking about uh, directed search, we said, okay, well, we had uh, chlorohydrocarbons uh, detected on Viking in 1976. Uh, let's see if we can find the chlorobenzene that Sam has detected on the Viking lander. So first, the hard part of uh, and the, 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 the longer part of this work was to find uh, the, the, the files of, there were no PDS at that time to, um, to um, uh, store all the data for uh, people to look at. And once the files were found, the other uh, hard part was to decipher uh, what they meant. It was some kind of binary files uh, with uh, with um, ab absolutely no means and no way to translate that to uh, to uh, MS. So it took a long time to uh, to be able to to reach the the GC MS data, and uh, it was it was found uh, from this data from 1976. In 2018, <laughs> that dichlorobenzene was actually uh, that chlorobenzene was actually present in the Viking data, and it was hidden for 50 years uh, in the in the data. You can see the mass uh, 112 and 114 at the about right ratio that you would expect from the chlorine isotopes, and on the right that the the data base from the MS of the chlorobenzene with 112 and 114 with a 114 at about one third of the 112. The chlorobenzene was identified in Viking, however, it needs lab confirmation with the retention time because you need to have a mass spec and a retention time to be confident for the identification of the molecule. And second, uh, it's not because there is chlorobenzene on Viking that it means there is organic molecule at the Viking landing site because the carbon and the chlorine may be a contamination. Uh, so it needs some more investigation to try to understand if it's from Mars uh, or if it's from contamination. Okay, chlorobenzene, uh, we have chlorobenzene on SAM, we have chlorobenzene uh, possibly, uh, possibly Martian on, uh, on Viking. And we think that it's a combination between chlorine and uh, carbon. Uh, so on SAM, it's uh, Martian chlorine, Martian carbon, uh, but likely a combination uh, in the SAM oven. So we want to know what is the precursor of these molecules. And from laboratory experiments, it was shown that benzoic acid is a good precursor from chloro for chlorobenzene because in some like condition, when you mix benzoic acid with uh, prochlorates, you obtain uh, chlorobenzene. We wanted to make sure and to make an experiment that was the closest possible to what happened in our SAM ovens. And we made from uh, the, the Mars Camelon sample a laboratory Camelon sample that is a Camelon analog. How did we perform that? We used the, the analysis from the chem in the chemical and um, chemistry and mineralogy instruments on uh, Curiosity that uh, uh, that deciphered the mineralogical composition of a common sample. And from this mineralogical composition of chemin, we made our own in the laboratory, the common analog. So by mixing 14 different minerals, taking some analogs. Uh, so for the X-ray amorphous, we guessed that uh, the Palagonite was a likely uh, X-ray amorphous uh, component of uh, that was observed by Kamin, and uh, we used the griffithites as the closest terrestrial analog for the iron smectite that was detected uh, at uh, at Mars at uh, twenty percent of the clay, and so we made this common analog. 
and investigated this uh, with the different um, uh, curiosity instruments. So we used it in the cam cam light instrument and in, a, of course, the SAM like instrument. And how did we perform that with SAM? We used the SAM test bed to, to load this, uh, this sample. The SAM test bed is the yellow box here in, uh, in the Mars chamber. And it's a mock-up of SAM. It's held at NASA Goddard. And it's operation in a Martian chamber that has the pressure and temperature of Mars. So it's supposed to replicate exactly what happens on SAM on Mars. And uh, on the left, the sample is opened uh, for maintenance. And in the middle, you can see, uh, so Amy McAdam uh, handling the common analog sample to Ariel, who puts the uh, sample down the, the SAM instrument with a special technique with a magnet, because at this time, the Mars chamber was closed. We don't want to, uh, to break the, the conditions that are in the Mars chamber. And the samples we used, oops, we, have, we used the common analog sample that we spiked with benzoic acid, 0.5%, and we spiked with uh, magnesium perchlorate at two weight percent. The two weight percent of magnesium perchlorate, it's from the estimation that uh, we have of uh, oxychlorine phase at common. As a blank, we used fused silica um, uh, spiked with two weight percent of magnesium perchlorate to make sure that the formation of chlorobenzene can not be done by something else than uh, uh, our, um, our benzoic acid and our cambolon analog. We also used cambolon analog by itself for analysis to make sure that it do not form um, uh, chlorobenzene without the presence of benzoic acid and magnesium perchlorate. The parameters that were used were to totally duplicate the GCMS run uh, done on Mars. And, uh, and uh, we used the, the test bed in evolved gas analysis, so direct MS and gas chromatography uh, uh, mass spectrometry. And this is the GCMS results of uh, this test bed run of our Cumberland analog spiked with benzoic acid and uh, magnesium perchlorate. The top chromatogram in blue is a result. We formed 28 picomol of chlorobenzene in the testbed in some conditions. And we also formed two isomers of dichlorobenzene. The control uh, uh, experiment is in black at the top. And there is no formation of chlorobenzene above the background level. There's a little bit of it, but uh, it's um, uh, at the background level. And we did not detect any dichlorobenzene in the, in the subsequent blank. And for reference at the bottom in pink, that's the Mars run with the 27 picomol of chlorobenzene that, uh, that were detected and the dichlorobenzene. Uh, the retention times are different because the two columns that were used for the test bed experiment and for the SAM experiment on Mars were different because of the clogging of, uh, of uh, the column. Not only were we able to detect the formation of chlorobenzene, but the abundance were similar to those observed in the three uh, Mars run that we did at Cumberland. And um, so the, the quantification is done on the, on, the, on the right plot, which shows first that benzoic acid is a good candidate for the organic precursor of the chlorobenzene at Cumberland, but that also the um, Oops, the, um, the, the 0.5 weight percent of benzoic acid may be really representative of what is present at Cambolon. So that's way higher than the detected chlorobenzene because when you do pyrolysis of the sample in presence of perchlorate, not only you chlorinate some sample, but when you uh, when when, uh, when the perchlorate is uh, heated and pyrolyzed, it will release a HCl that chlorinates the sample, but also oxygen that will uh, oxidize the sample. So the detection uh, of uh, the chlorobenzene, the 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 few tenths of picomol detected is the lower limit 
there is a competition between chlorination and oxidation. And a lot of oxidation means that you have more CO2 and uh, less of the chlorobenzene. Okay, back to the common, same common uh, sample than uh, the one we detected the chlorobenzene and the dichlorobenzene uh, and the other chlorohydrocarbons. Uh, on this sample, we did 15 experiments uh, on the on subsamples of chlorobenzene. So it was very comprehensive study with different parameters with SAM. And we detected at the high temperature, uh, sulfur bearing molecules. So same type of chromatogram uh, at the top, it's Morris at the bottom, it's laboratory to compare the retention type. And uh, on the right are the five sulfur containing molecules that were detected at Cambolon. And this time it was by heating the sample uh, above 600 degrees. And that's interesting because above 600 degrees, you have no more oxychlorine because all of the oxychlorine has been already degraded uh, at lower temperature. And what I did not mention is that the chlorobenzene and dichlorobenzene, they were detected at temperature between 200 and 400 degrees uh, of heating of the sample. And above 600 degrees, uh, no more oxychlorine, so no more chlorination of the molecules. And uh, no chlorine, five molecules detected containing sulfur. The origin of the sulfur containing compounds um, are unknown. There are two different possibilities. Either it's released from the sulfates that decomposes at this temperature. And when it's released, it's either released uh, already sulfurized or it can be sulfurized uh, from precursors, carbon containing molecules and inorganic sulfur containing molecules uh, such as SO2 and H2S that are released from the sulfate decomposition. And then still at Cumberland, uh, another experiment that was done, I told you uh, 15 different experiments that were done. And uh, this time is what we call the, the opportunistic derivatization. So I will not go into the detail of that. It's a wet chemistry experiment. We have a wet chemistry solvent in SAM and uh, one of them, one or more of them uh, is leaking. And we observe uh, this solvent in our runs. It was decided to perform an opportunistic derivatization without puncturing one of the cups that contained the solvent. We wanted to use the solvents uh, as a leak to, to still perform derivatization. And for that, uh, it was a two-step experiment, I told you about the versatility of SAM, and this was totally not planned initially. We preheated the sample um, to, that's the red part of it. We preheated the sample uh, to release the oxygen. This plot here is the EGA plot. So in X axis, you have the temperature of the sample from ambient to 800 degrees. And the different traces represent the uh, gases that are evolved from the sample at the different temperature. The oxygen in green, uh, it saturates, that's why it drops at one point, but the oxygen uh, is released from the perchlorate decomposition and between 200 and 450 degrees. So the point of this first heating step was to completely degrade the perchlorate to remove the oxygen so that in the second step, we can paralyze the sample in absence of oxygen, raise the temperature, the compounds at high temperature and not oxidize them with the oxygen that is released from the sample. Because in the first step, we have removed the oxygen. And that's what we did. And uh, so let me uh, not talk about that one. And the result of the second step uh, of the, the, the opportunistic derivatization run was uh, the detection of um, uh, long chain hydrocarbons in SAM. And uh, in yellow, you can see the Mars run with reconstructed chromatograms with the mass uh, 57, which is specific for hydrocarbons. And the C10, C11, and C12 hydrocarbons were detected in high temperature in the second step of our opportunistic derivatization run. So that's, that was unexpected. And uh, we 
we we uh, perform this experiment to uh, to to, uh, to perform wet chemistry, and what we detected was uh, uh, how to say that little. It was basically uh, thanks to the removal of the oxygen that we we wanted to remove to avoid the oxidation or of our wet chemistry compound that we were able not to oxidize molecules present in the sample and detect uh, a longer molecular chain uh, hydrocarbons. This was confirmed in the laboratory and in the test bed by retention time, as usual. And it was also confirmed by the mass spectrum and the comparison of the mass spectrum in blue of uh, the, the library uh, of uh, the NIST library for mass spectrum and in orange, the SAM mass spectrum of the decane uh, confirms that it's actually this compound that combined to, uh, to the retention time of the compounds. It confirms that it's actually decane and decane and the decane that were detected on Mars. And the origin of the decane is unknown, as usual, because origin are harder to understand uh, the, in, on Mars. And uh, laboratory experiments showed that um, in presence of um, uh, a clay and of um, carboxylic acid, when you hit the sample in some like conditions, you decarboxylate um, carboxylic acids to form alkanes and CO2. Uh, it's, it was shown in, in this example with phthalic acid, which is, uh, which is um, uh, an aromatic and not an aliphatic as uh, the endocanoic acid. But the decarboxylation of phthalic acid uh, into benzoic acid at high temperature and into benzene, so double decarboxylation at uh, six, uh, 560 degrees, shows that we do decarboxylate at really high temperature carboxylic acid to form um, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the alkane corresponding, the N minus one alkane. And that's uh, one hypothesis for the presence of decane that it was uh, present as um, um, carboxylic acid in the sample and released at high temperature up to 700 degrees in the, uh, during the sulfate, the, the iron sulfate decomposition of our sample. Okay, so that's uh, the sum up of uh, what we have detected on SAM with, uh, in terms of organics. At low temperature, below 500 degrees, we have chlorohydrocarbons. At high temperature, above 500 degrees, there are sulfur containing compounds and long chain hydrocarbons. So that's a variety of different molecules at different temperatures of evolution, which shows that there are different um, uh, origins of these molecules. And uh, if we just look at the conclusion on that one, but it's the EGA mod of, uh, of uh, SAM, and there is a lot of release of CO2 that is unexplained. So each peak that we see on the, on the right plot at the different samples on Mars, and each peak, it's the CO2 peak. And it's a different temperature, different abundance, et cetera. But if all the CO2 comes from organic carbon, it means that we have ppm of organic matter on mars so that's the co2 we cannot say co2 comes from organic matter uh, on mars we can only say if co2 comes from organic carbon it means that uh, we do not know the origin of the co2 it's not the carbonate when you look at the temperature of decomposition and it's unexplained by the background that we have on sam so that's uh, in line with the, the lab experiments with um, uh, the uh, Cumberland analog, which um, shows that we may have much more uh, quantity of organics in the Cumberland sample that, uh, that we think from the uh, quantities that we have in fine after the pyrolysis. Why Cumberland is that interesting? Uh, basically, in Cumberland, we have detected almost all the organic molecules that we have detected on Mars with Curiosity. And it's interesting because um, uh, at Cumberland, we have 20% of clays. 
and clays, they have high surface area. Uh, the interlayer are charged negatively to absorb the organics. And the cation associated with the water in the interlayer will retard the water flow and concentrate organics. The clays they are known to be ideal candidates for accumulating and preserving organics over geological times, that's the context. And also, Cumberland was uh, measured to have a very low exposure time. And although the sample is almost 4 billion years old, it was exposed to radiation for only 80 million years. So it was buried and then re-exposed only 80 million years uh, ago, which um, uh, uh, helps in preserving the, the samples, the organics. So Gale Crater, it was habitable. It had uh, liquid water, energy source, temperature, organic matter. That was the aim of curiosity. It fulfilled its aim of uh, determining uh, Gale Crater as being habitable. Cumberland, it's really an ideal, ideal type of sample. If we would want to bring a sample back from Mars, I would totally go back to Cumberland and bring it back because it has simple uh, primordial molecules. It has also complex molecules that are yet unidentified with derivatization, but detected. Uh, it has interesting sulfur isotope, it has nitrates, it's freshly exposed, and it has an optimal mineralogy with 20% of smectite. So because we know that uh, from chemistry to biology, we can observe a, a complexification of the molecules. We have detected the simple molecules at Gale Crater. Now uh, let's uh, look for prebiotic or biomolecules with other missions, right? Because curiosity is not meant to detect those type of molecules. It was meant to detect simple molecules, and it did. OK, I see that it's time. Just want to finish on curiosity with the, the, the future steps. And the future steps is that we are now at the clay surface transition. You can see in, in a yellow, uh, it's uh, our path, um, the Curiosity Traverse, the 25 kilometers. And now we're reaching the clay surface transitions. Clays are very good for preservation of organics. We're reaching the sulfates really, really soon. And, uh, and sulfates are also known to be uh, very good for um, uh, preserving molecules if the molecules were, um, uh, um, uh, when the sulf if the sulfate did uh, precipitate uh, within the right conditions, uh, with the right pH conditions, it preserves very easily the organic molecules. And in the, on the right image, uh, we are now at the non-tron. Um, uh, it's the last drill hole that we did, the non-tron drill hole. Just want to point out that we named uh, yesterday officially a mountain um, uh, after uh, Rafael Navarro Gonzalez, who passed away uh, from uh, uh, early, uh, early this year. And uh, so now there is a mountain uh, to his name to, to honor uh, this uh, Sam scientist. And we are going to contour this mountain and to reach the sulfate layer very soon. And in the next two minutes, uh, that's, uh, do I have two minutes left? Yeah, two minutes is fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I, I will uh, mention the, um, the ExoMars mission 2022 and the Mars Organic Molecule Analyzer, uh, which is uh, improved some. <laughs> and uh, the ExoMars goal, is to reach for biosignatures. It's not habitability anymore, it's biosignature. Now we have the context, the habitability. We're going to look for the biosignatures. And it had three particular specifics that will help in that. First, ExoMars will drill down to two meters in Mars surface, which is it's much more than the few centimeters of curiosity. And down to two meters, the samples are way more preserved uh, from the radiation that reaches the surface of Mars. And also the perchlorate concentration, it may decrease with depth. It's unknown and we will, um, we will investigate that. And if there are less perchlorate uh, down the surface, uh, there, there is uh, less oxidation that will be performed. Then uh, the second specifics of MoMA is that it has some wet chemistry to look for chirality of molecules. 
and chirality helps on understanding the origin of molecule. And it can discriminate between a biological origin of a molecule, particularly an amino acid, or um, a chemical orig uh, origin of uh, the, the same molecule. And lastly, it has some laser disruption and ionization mass spectrometry. It's a complementary way to the GCMS, which shoots a laser, a laser at a sample, disorb the molecule, and send everything to the GCMS, uh, to the MS, sorry. And uh, this allows to detect patterns in molecular mass. It will not identify independently all the molecules, but it will sent all the masses at once in the MS for looking for patterns and very high molecular weight molecules, while uh, GCMS is uh, uh, limited to medium, uh, low to medium molecular mass molecules. And that's uh, the, um, uh, the diagram of what we can see in terms of molecular weight of molecule with pyrolysis, medium, uh, low to medium, Derivatization, medium molecular weight, and laser disruption, the high molecular weight molecules. And now to the conclusion slide. And uh, I can either uh, leave it here, uh, that's a, a sum up of what we've learned, and uh, I can take questions uh, on, uh, on this slide maybe. All right, thanks a lot. That was a great talk and very exciting things going on at Mars. So I will start with a quick question on your slide 29. You showed uh, about 80 million year uh, it took for, uh, there was a, an age, 80 million years. Ah, sorry, sorry, the like, yes, 80 million years. So how did you come up with that number? Oh, sorry, there is a lag in. Um, that's uh, by measuring isotopes. And uh, I can refer to the uh, Ken Farley um, paper. And um, it's, uh, it's a measure of different isotopes. I think it, uh, there are two different uh, ratios of isotopes. I think there is a helium three. Uh, I, I have to double check. Which, okay. which one, but it, it's isotopic uh, measurements. Okay, I'll check this paper out, thanks. Yeah. I just want to make the remark, uh, I really enjoyed the talk. Thank I'm you. surprised uh, how much is known about Mars and how much lab work is required to get at even one simple fact and how one has to be very rigorous about all these things. Um, this is all new to me. Uh, but I want to ask something very simple. How much contamination of uh, Mars uh, has already occurred through all these instruments that have been launched? And I wonder if uh, the Gale crater was chosen with some a priori knowledge or was it just an accident? So for the contamination, uh, there are uh, two, two answers. There is first the contamination that we bring from Earth. And for that, we limit the contamination. Um, basically, the biological contamination, there is none because we have to uh, answer to a planetary yeah. protection rules. Yeah. And then there is the chemistry contamination. And yeah. we try to limit it, uh, but... Um, it can happen that there is some, some contamination or background that was unexpected. It's the case on SAM where we have a leak of our wet chemistry solvent. Yeah. Yeah. Fortunately, we know the isotopic composition of it. And from lab runs, we know how it reacts with the different uh, Martian compounds and uh, particularly the perchlorates. And, uh, and from the lab runs, we are able to discriminate between the contamination and uh, the indigenous to, to Mars. And then there is also the cross contamination between samples. And that is a, a huge uh, hurdle. And um, what, what I want to just reply to that is that if it comes from a sample or the next one and you see amino acids, you're happy, whatever. Even, even if it, uh, it's not from their last sample, but the previous one and it stayed in the lines, 
it's fine. But there is this cross contamination that is uh, that is um, uh, an issue, and sometimes we don't know from each sample is um, are, are the compounds. Yes. I was also asking if uh, Gale crater was chosen uh, with some a priori knowledge, or was it just by happenstance? Yeah, it was chosen uh, with knowledge from orbit. And okay. because uh, we knew from orbit that it had layers, and it was supposed that the layers that were observed were deposited by liquid water. And okay. it was confirmed that it was a lake. But okay. it, was, it, it was a guess, because it could have been some aeolian uh, layering. And in that case, that would have much less interest. But no, it was a lake. <laughs> yeah. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. It was a very nice talk. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. Landing site selection itself is a very complex process. Yeah, and all yeah. that. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Sahmud bin, please go ahead. Well, I'm happy to see Sahmud bin on the seminar. Sahmud bin, uh, you're allowed to, to ask question if you're there. Oh, sorry. I I I apologize. I sent the. Uh... The question. The question I had was, thank you very much, of course, for the talk. But I was, I, I wanted to know what is the temperature during day or night of the area where the soil was taken, where the drills were done, and mm -hmm. was there any detection of glycine or heterocyc or other or or heterocyclic organic compounds? Okay, so for the temperature, it depends on the season. And uh, in summer during the day, it can be plus ten degrees centigrade. And uh, in winter during the night, it can be minus 70. And so usually we drill at a specific time, but I can't remember. Uh, I think it's during the day. I'm pretty sure it's during the day that we drill. And then the analysis, uh, it's usually done at night to keep the temperature uh, uh, cooler for our, our instruments. And uh, so it varies uh, from minus 70 to plus 10 for, uh, for the for the drilling, uh, drilling part. And uh, I see where you go with that, uh, with a likely, uh, the, you, 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 you are wondering if we can change the chemistry of the sample by drilling. And it is the case because when we drill, then we have, uh, we, we, we have the drill in, uh, in our arm and we dispense portions. And it can take days between the first portion is analyzed and the last portion is analyzed. And uh, between the first portion that is fresh re, fl freshly drilled and the last portion that has stayed for days in the, in the, um, in, in the drill bit, uh, there, there are some changes that we observed in uh, mostly in EGA mode, in direct MS. So there is some mineralogical uh, and, uh, and chemical change, geochemical change. And then your second question, uh, no, we did not detect any amino acids. So no, gl no glycine. We looked specifically for it because we do some directed search and we were very interested by amino acids. We did not detect um, uh, amino acids or heterocycles. Uh, the, uh, the only molecule we clearly identified was the, the one I presented uh, on, the, on, on the slide. Uh, uh, which was before. The, fat, the fatty acid? The fatty acid were not detected, they are suspected. Uh, they are suspected because there is a detection, oops, here. Because there is detection of um, uh, decaying, undecaying, and dodecaying. And uh, the origin of, so that's what were actually detected, the hydrocarbons. And what is suspected is that they were present as fatty acids in the sample and that they were decarboxylated in some. But it's a hypothesis that is supported by lab experiments, but that's a hypothesis. Thank you. Uh, Kevin, go ahead. Uh, hello, can you listen to me? Yeah, yeah, yep. go ahead. Okay, no, uh, thank you very much for the talk. Um, my question is that if you think the instruments that were sent uh, in SAM were enough to determine the habitability in the crater, um, and if not, then which other instrument would you have sent as well? 
Okay, yeah. Uh, uh, yes, the, uh, the payload, the 10 instruments on SAM were able to affirm that they were, uh, that Gale Crater was habitable. With uh, all together, the 10 instruments detected uh, liquid water in the, in the past, uh, mild pH, uh, the, the standing water of, um, uh, in Gale, the lake was uh, about at neutral pH. And uh, the temperature was uh, was mild, and uh, the the salinity was mild. So everything everything was, and the energy source was present. And now that we have detected the organic matter, uh, and the building blocks uh, for for life, all the elements for habitability were discovered at Gale Crater. And Gale is uh, 3.6 to 3.8 billion years old. So uh, the conclusion is that 3.6 to 3.8 billion years old ago, uh, Gale Crater was habitable. I see, thank you. Uh, Panche, do you have any questions or comments? Um, yes, actually, thank you very much for a fantastic talk. I really enjoyed it, uh, as a chemist especially. So, okay. Caroline, I have a question about your model experiments. You used magnesium perchlorate, which is known to be very hygroscopic. Uh, yeah. Do you think that that has introduced some water perhaps in the system, and does it have any effect on the results? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, the, the water was not controlled in these experiments. And uh, there is uh, a few percent of water in um, in uh, Mars uh, samples, mm -hmm. and uh, and so so we considered that the variation in uh, in the water content in our uh, Cumberland analog sample was not impacting uh, the um, the uh, the results of the experiment, even if it was not controlled. And we do see uh, more water in our Cumberland analog sample than in Cumberland uh, in, uh, with the ChemCam data. And, uh, but it's not uh, from zero to 10%. It's, uh, it's uh, two to 3% on Mars and it's few percent, but not constrained on, uh, on our sample. So we did not consider it, have, uh, it had um, uh, an important uh, impact. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Uh, are there any other questions? Just raise your hand or type it out. Yeah, I see. Any question? Yeah, there is one question. Let me. Uh, Nosrat, go ahead. So can we? Hello, and thank you for the talk. Hello, Dimitri. Uh, everyone, I want to know about the value of the habitated, how we define the absolute value, how we assign a number to the habitated by the using the chemistry of the molecules. This is my, my question. In other methods, you can obtain some numbers. Can you obtain a number by using organic uh, molecules? Thank you. Mm, not, not really. The numbers we can obtain is the quantification of organic molecules, but habitability is not only about organics. It's only one of the criteria for habitability. The others are uh, liquid water and uh, conditions of uh, pH, salinity, etc., and energy. And it's more a uh, yes or no rather than a numbered um, um, habitability response. And what we can assess is the local habitability. It's not because Gale Crater was habitable that uh, 100 kilometers uh, away, uh, Mars was habitable. So it's local habitability. It's yes or no, there, there is no number on, on that. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, Anusri, go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Hi, Carolyn. Uh, this is a wonderful talk. Thank you. And, and it's very informative. Yeah. So uh, my question is that, uh, what's your explanation uh, for, for the detection of the long uh, abiotic uh, origin of the long chain hydrocarbons? Oh, 
Um, so that's a good question. Are, are, uh, first, are you, are you the Anushri uh, that, uh, that I know? Yes, because I, I'm the same okay. Anushri, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a common name, so I... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, so good to really, see you. Really wonderful uh, listening to you. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, so the origin of, uh, it's, it's always the, the question of origin because uh, uh, we detected the hydrocarbons. Uh, we think the origin is um, um, carboxylic acids. But then the question is what, what is the origin of these carboxylic acids, right? <laughs> and there is no answer to that. It can be, uh, it can be from a meteoritic um, uh, impact. We know that uh, there are um, uh, a lot of uh, carboxylic acids uh, and amino acids on meteorites, and that uh, that uh, this this brings uh, a lot of organics at the surface of Mars. So we would expect to see carboxylic acids, as we would expect to see amino acids, but we did not. And uh, it can be from Mars itself, from atmospheric um, uh, only atmospheric reactions or hydrothermal reactions uh, happening on Mars billions of years ago. And it can be from biology uh, happening on Mars uh, billions of years ago. So it has, uh, it has different possible origins and none can be, uh, uh, none can be confirmed uh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. But obviously the, the abiotic origin uh, is favored. And, but then is it abiotic from Mars or is it abiotic from uh, impacts um, uh, from meteorite or, or uh, comets? Uh, that's totally unknown. Yeah, thank you. All right, if there are no more questions, then let us thank the speaker. Thanks, Caroline. That was a great talk and thanks for giving us your time. And, thank you uh, all. Yeah, I'll see you all next week. Thanks a lot. Okay, bye. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Thank Thanks, you. Bye-bye.